Welcome back to the Data Driven Real Estate Podcast. I'm Aaron, and this is episode 19. This week, we've got Patrick Ferry. He is a longtime real estate trainer and coach. Uh, he's worked in the family business, Tom Ferry International, for a number of years and also with his brother, but he's also an agent active in the San Diego market. We cover a ton of ground this week, including what a modern agent looks like in 2020, how to survive the next 10 years when there's a lot of disruptors in the market, and what it really means to be a data driven realtor. That and much more on this week's episode. Welcome to the Data Driven Real Estate Podcast, the podcast for real estate professionals dedicated to driving business using data. I'm Aaron Norris with co host Sean O'Toole with Property Radar. And today we have Patrick Ferry. Welcome, Patrick. Thanks, guys. Yeah, super excited to be here. I guess we better start with your entree into the real estate business and everything you've been working on. Awesome. Yeah. So the, the, the fast version is, you know, obviously Ferry, my father, Mike Ferry, started real estate coaching, you know, 40 years ago. And I work for his company. You know, I've been all across the country helping real estate agents pretty much for the last 17 years. And then about seven years ago, I shifted over to my brother, Tom Ferry's coaching company because I was kind of excited about all of the new stuff, you know, online, social, you know, the direct mail. And I really w wanted to really explore everything online, all, all marketing. And so that's, I made that shift over to his company in the last seven years. You know, it's been a lot of fun really looking at, you know, how to grow teams, but then also all of the new lead generation and marketing platforms and systems. So that's really kind of where, you know, I've been geeking out, having a ton of fun with, you know, kind of what are, what is the modern model for lead conversion and lead generation kind of coming from the foundational stuff. And, you know, and I know you guys both spent a lot of time on that stuff too. So it's super fun. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm very excited about, you know, property radar, you know, moving into the residential real estate space. And uh, cause that's been very exciting. And I, as I told Aaron or Sean, I didn't tell you, but I, it was like one o'clock in the morning, I woke up and I was like property radar. It, and this was like two weeks ago. And I went and I looked on your guys' website. I clicked on the, you know, residential real estate and I read through and I was like, oh my gosh, there's so many things that I need right now for my coaching clients with what you guys did. And then as I've talked to Aaron and Frank, I started really looking deeply into, okay, well, you know, Aaron said this cheesy thing to me, which forced me to really think. He said, he's all, I just want you to dream in data. <laughs> and I was like, I'm, I was like, that's so cheesy, right? And then all of a sudden, like my brain starts going in all these different directions. What if I had a list like this? What if I can get that? Well, what if I could do this? What if I could do that? What if I could do? And then all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh, I'm dreaming well, in data. This is so I, silly. Right? I know it sounds cheesy, but I think that's one of the hurdles that I run into the most is people don't know what the data sets that are available and how you can stack them and play. And until you show them and they're like, what? I mean, yeah. I was a property radar user for six years and <laughs> didn't know the demographic data was there. I'm like, oh my God. So yeah. it's yeah, cheesy, so, but it works. No, so, it did. It, it, it got me going. And, uh, and, you know, I think, and, you know, one of the things that I'm super appreciative is when I, cause I like, right. You know, the, the motivation for me looking back to property radar was because I was looking, I was talking to a couple other of the kind of industry data companies and I was saying, Hey, here's what we need. I need to be able to, you know, do a couple of these very specific functions so that I can create these lead generation campaigns for myself and for my clients. And I was kind of pushing on them to get it done, but man, that's an uphill battle. And that's when I was like, wait a minute, maybe I should check in with these guys to see what they're up to. So that's, that's where it kind of led, right? So I'm excited, you know, as you guys are rolling across nationally, I think that's really interesting to me. So you know, I'll be, I'll be connecting with you guys much more deeply, you know, but I think for, you know, general right now, I think the number one thing that is very exciting is this idea of what we can do with a buyer, right? So now I've been, you know, I've been looking at the buyer online conversion uh, process very deeply looking at, you know, what's going on between Zillow, pay-per-click, Facebook, all the CRMs, you know, what's the difference between SEO, YouTube, you know, and I've been really looking all of them and I'm going, wow, this is a complete train wreck for a real estate agent. 
Yeah, right? it's and, tough. Yeah, and then I go, okay, well, what is the actual, the value of the service and the service proposition to a buyer to give me loyalty? And what's, what's happening is, is, you know, most people can go on to Zillow or go to Redfin and they can kind of say, hey, show me the property, right? right. And so- Schedule even a time, yeah. yeah. Schedule a time. And I've got that on my website right now. And so what's happened is kind of this movement towards kind of the real estate agent no longer is an actual consultant and they no longer are offering anything that has unique value. Right. And so what the door. Yep, exactly. Go get that door open for me. And if I like it, I'll write, I'll write up the offer with you. And that is a very, very dangerous proposition for real estate agents. Now, so, so when I thought about this, you know, the super low inventory environment, I already constructed an, an offer to a buyer that said, Hey, let me go find off market properties for you. And, you know, coming from my background, it was like, hey, let's, I could pull up all of the expireds from the last five years, any for sale by owners. I could pull up the, you know, withdrawns. I can maybe do a little bit of for rent research. And, you know, and I can go find you opportunities, uh, you know, to kind of provide you more opportunities today if you know exactly what you want. So come meet with me and I'll show you what I can do. That had a, a good value proposition to the buyer. But now I'm like, okay, if I could take this to the next level. So, hey, come in, meet with me. Instead of me just being someone who just opens doors, come meet with me. Let me show you what I can find off market that previously was on, see if there's anything there. And then now tell me exactly what you want and I'll go find it kind of in the property radar and this is what I'm excited about is can I create a list that says, hey, you wanted, right, four bedrooms, three baths, you wanted it on this part of the golf course with this, with that, and you want these factors. Now I can create that list and now, you know, hire me to become a, your real estate, you know, your real estate agent. And then now I will go find you properties that are currently not available to, you know, on the MLS or on Zillow or anything else. Now I'm tracking all of those. So the reason for you're going to hire me is because I'm going to do all of that. Plus, if anything else shows up, you know, I'll write up the offer for you. So I think that's going to be a hugely valuable, uh, you know, offer, right, to get a better relationship with the buyer coming in and to offer something that doesn't exist currently in the marketplace. So that is something just like right off the top of my head. I'm super excited about. I right? don't. I have to admit, I don't know anybody else who's talking like that. I don't know realtors that are deploying the strategy. Not at all. No, and yeah, it's it's not. And go ahead, Sean. I'll, I'll... I, I would say I, I'm uh, shopping for a second home right now, right? And I have some very particular things that I, I want in the area that I'm looking. And of course, I buy everything off market because that's what I do. Right. <laughs> ah, and I, go, there's, one, there's one little piece I would add, right, is... You know, we had this kind of wish list in our head of what we wanted, and we went off market and we looked for all the properties that had that, and there aren't any. Right. And so, you know, it's pretty easy too as a buyer to have uh, expectations that just don't exist in that market. And when you can show somebody through data that doesn't exist, now I've either got to change my expectations, yes. right? Or we're thinking, okay, we're going to tear something down and build. Yeah. So, but now it's just, you know, but, but how do you know that without going and looking? And, you know, I, I can't tell you how many uh, realtors like, yeah, I wish we had something like that. There's just nothing on the market right now. Well, it's not that there's nothing on the market. There's nothing. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. What did you add? What, what's your wish list? What is that? <laughs> yeah. That's a pretty intense <laughs> wish list. I like that. It's, uh, it's not that intense, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, one of the, and, and I'll, I'll kind of give one of the hacks that I just recently kind of figured out too, with exactly what you said, Sean, is I had a buyer kind of reach out to me for San Diego and they're like, Hey, we're going to buy in the spring of this next year. And so, and he was like, this is what I want. And he was like, can you show, you know, he kind of was in town visiting family and I'm like, okay, I could go show him a bunch of property, 
but that's going to be, a, I'm going to spend a bunch of time. It's going to be a waste of time. So I was like, what else can I do to make it a valuable experience for them and for me? So I brought him into the office, pulled up the MLS, and I just basically said, okay, what do you guys want? Oh, you want up to 850. You want a three bedroom, two bath, detached. And ideally you want it in Carlsbad. And so I was like, well, there's four zip codes in Carlsbad. So let's just take a look. And I just pulled it up on the MLS. I showed it to him right there on the big screen. And I'm like, oh, do you see that? There's nothing active for sale with, the, with that category. There's six pending under contract. And in the last 12 months, this is how many sold. And I kind of sorted it by the highest price sold. And then we looked at it and they were able to go, oh, that's all I get for 850. And I was like, <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. And so that I was able to swap that out. Let me show you this other area, other zip code. Look what you can get. There's more active, more pending. So there was a little bit of, you know, kind of me helping them to calibrate their expectations oh, through man. a little bit of that process, which again, you know, the kind of the, you know, the, the thread that I'm seeing is as, as real estate agents working with buyers, we're really doing a pretty terrible job educating the buyer you know, leveraging data, leveraging tools, leveraging resources, putting them into a professional consultation environment and to educate them through, you know, kind of what, what this whole thing is about and what the market's all about. So now what's Google funny, and, no... yeah, what, what, and I'll say one funny thing and I'll, and is on the sell side, you know, if, if you were to, if I was to, you were to invite me to list your property, that's what I do every time, right? I'll cut, I'll do this huge market research. I'll come in right. and I'll explain the market. I'll show you comps. I'll show you the, what I do, the, how I do it, this whole elaborate, you know, and big presentation on the buy side. What do we do? Oh, you want to see the property? Let's go. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Well, and, and what's interesting too here is, is that, you know, Zillow has and Redfin and whatever have made it pretty easy for uh, consumers to self-search for yes. listed yeah. properties. Right. None of those platforms have made it easy to self-search for off-market properties. Mm -hmm. And that is still where you as a realtor can provide differentiation, right? Absolutely. Because if you can show them the kinds of things, the past sales, the uh, things that happen, how many sales in your market are happening outside of the MLS? Mm -hmm. It's surprisingly high in a lot of areas. Yes. And, you know, when you can tap all of that and show that now you become a valuable resource again versus just showing the listed and sold stuff that's on Zillow that they can go look at for themselves. Exactly. Exactly. Actually, that brings up a really good point. Um, and I, and it, cause it's part of the offering and part of the offering is to, is to let them know that there's something happening that they don't know about. And that is the off market sales. And yeah. so I, and I'm sure you guys have an ability almost to say, Hey, in this zip code, and, and I'm asking in this zip code in the last 12 months, this many properties sold off the MLS. Could I, could I almost pull that report by the way? One of our criteria is was listed, right? Okay. So, got it. Um, and you say was listed equals no on your sales and show recent sales where was listed equals no. And it does a pretty good job. I, I will say our listing data is, is a little bit incomplete. It's a fact set. So um, it's not perfect, but it will do a, a pretty good job of showing you what those were. Yeah. Yeah. List. <laughs> List, once I became a realtor, right, you know, 17 years in the, you know, training and coaching world, then I became a realtor, then I was like, oh, now I know why the, this data is such a train wreck. <laughs> it's because they're kind of relying on us to, you know, fill out all these fields. And, you know, and it's such a pain in the butt. And it's really laborious. And we just kind of cut a lot of corners naturally, just because it's like, it's such a disaster. And so then I was like, Oh, that's why the data sets so screwed up, right? Yeah. And and it was an interesting observation for me once I was deep in it, you know. And that, and that doesn't even get into like gaming days on market and all the other things. Oh, oh, totally. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Which trust me, I've done numerous times. <laughs> yeah. Don't get me wrong. 
Patrick, it's interesting that you started with the buy side. Really difficult in this market. It's always the most difficult. You you didn't even l mention the listing side of this business until way further on. Is it is it that just happens automatically? Uh, why did you decide to focus on something that's the most difficult part of the business? Yeah. So great, great question. Here's what's interesting. You know, because you know, with my dad's company, we basically were uh, born and raised get listings and build a scalable listing business. That's that's what I was born and raised with. Right. And so, you know, fast forward here, we've got so much interesting opportunity to attract the buyer online in all these unique channels. Right. So I've been just kind of trying to master that workflow, which is a disaster in our industry. So A, if I can master the workflow and provide an amazing solution, you know, to the real estate community, you know, that would be awesome. And it'd make me a lot of money, of course. Right. So there's a little bit of that. But then as I got deeper into it, I realized, man, this is really important for the industry that we actually create a significantly uh, valuable experience as a real estate consultant to the buyer on the way in, right? And so I think a lot of problems in, in real estate occur because there was a lack of quality education to the buyer about real estate as an asset class, uh, property types, how this thing operates and how it will positively or negatively influence your life financially or lifestyle. And so I kind of saw from a big picture looking down going, oh man, this is kind of a disaster, right? And all of the top agents are just obsessed with getting more listings. And so there's this obsession in the, in the industry that's get listings, gets the listings, and it's like a cultural thing. To the degree which which I found fascinating, I'd be at a, a big event, whether or not it's my, my brother's event or my dad's event. And if you were a top buyer's agent, you actually were looked down upon in the environment. Yeah. You're like, oh, you're a buyer's agent. Like, oh. Right? Like that's, so it's yeah. a cultural totally thing. True. Yeah, in yeah. the industry. So it's, so it's slightly fascinating to me to see that, but I also see like, and this is my, you know, my nerdy prediction. If, if anything gets commoditized and automated, in my opinion, it's the listing side. Mm. Because as a, as, a, as a guru and a consultant, you know, in my family, we built our, we have built our business and our world around offering service that's just consultative service. That's how we make money. Right. So there's no nothing tangible. I'm doing anything. So when I look at the two, I go, wow, the buy side actually has a lot of great consultation opportunity. It also has a, a really great education ability. And when you put someone into a marketplace, there's also opportunity for a lot more referrals, longevity. Right. And then if you end up getting their listing on the way out. So your actual uh, your income, the lifetime value of the income of a, of a client is significantly better when you work with the buyer on the way in. So you can make significantly more money there. So that's where I was like, wait a minute, all of the cultural thought process, yes, that makes sense. List to live, all the stupid stuff that we stay. But at the same time, man, as I look over here, I'm like, no, no, no. I think the future is really do a better job with these buyers and really help people make better decisions and help them navigate a lot of this process. So I think there's just a good opportunity there. The buy side's so much more, I mean, I think that the, the challenge is, right, is it's so much more difficult, right? When people have, they're all over the board, they're trying to make really tough decisions, giving them good advice is hard and all the rest. On the listing side, it's a pretty simple deal, right? Get that contract signed, put it on the MLS, you know, maybe do a fly or whatever, but it's, it's pretty simple. Um, as, as a realtor, right? It, it's a much easier job, you know, hard to get that signature, but once you do, you're golden. And um, on the buy side, it, it's, it's, it's challenging. You got to educate folks where, where to live, school districts, it's just so much more, which comes back to the data-driven side, right? A lot of that is, is, is data-driven um, too. So that's a, that's a really fascinating, uh, Fascinating point. Uh, a lot, a lot, a lot more difficult, but a lot, you're adding a lot more value. Right. Exactly. 
Yeah, I've been trained. My dad kind of trained me to think through this whole like, you know, the value of your service is in direct correlation to your income. And so I start to kind of like, okay, well, what's the real value of the service that I can offer here? And then can I increase the perceived value of that service is really the game that I play today is right, especially, you know, and that's what we did on the listing side for gazillions of years. Let me show you how amazing I list homes for and how incredible it's gonna be to try and, you know, elevate the perceived value of it. But in today's super low inventory, high, high buyer demand environment, it really is like, just don't screw it up, right? <laughs> now, don't get me wrong, you know, like one, my, my wife just, my wife yeah. just listed a property and it was actually a very interesting story. This is a very, very smart guy. He's bought seven investment properties with her and uh, they were going to sell off a couple of these, these townhomes and they completely underestimated her advice on, on a finishing off and getting new appliances and staging totally underestimated it. They're like, nah, it's not necessary. So she lists the property and <laughs> we get, a 50,000 below list price offer. This is like a month ago, right? In San Diego, in, wow. in, the, in the high moving price point. And then they got an 85,000 below list price offer. So then took the home off the market, got the appliances in, staged it within three days, got an over $10,000 list price offer, just wow. like that. So there is in the list side, there is some consultation moves that are really valuable because that's a $90,000 swing, you know, just on the advice that the agent was giving that the seller was kind of just dismissing, you know, like. I would like to point out too, purple bricks. I was really surprised that they folded when they did, but that was yes. the idea that you don't need skill to list. It's just, here's yeah. a prop tech company that can do it for you, cheap one price. And I was shocked that they folded when they, they went out when they did. I see the opposite too, though, right? Like where people will go spend all this money to fix something up. And this is true mostly at the lower end where people tend to undervalue how much it really costs to fix something up and make it nice. And so that do it yourself comes in and says, oh, you know, okay, I'm going to buy this house for 450. It would list for 470, right? you know, it actually needs $50,000 worth of work, but they think they're saving 20 grand and they can make it up in sweat equity, right? Yeah, like, exactly. So like it's both sides can happen, but you have to know that specific buyer, you know, in a townhome and an upscale project, that person isn't looking for sweat equity, right? Whereas a single family home in a lower middle class there, they want sweat equity. And so you kind of have to, you know, and that's where an agent can still add a ton of value. Yeah, exactly. Before we get more into the marketing, Patrick, I would love to hear your story a little bit because you moved into San Diego. So you started from scratch not too long ago and mm -hmm. how you approached a, a brand new market as a newbie. Yeah, actually, it was very humbling, right? The, um, because, it, and it really caused me to understand what really good value was for a real estate agent. And, and one of the big things was, is, is hyper-local expertise, as we've, as we've kind of been discussing. Now, in a lot of the big surveys, NAR and Zillow, that actually was the thing that buyers were looking for in the agent was the hyper-local. That always has been one of the things the consumer said that they were looking for. But I didn't quite understand that until I was standing in an open house in San Diego which I'm not from here. I know pretty much nothing about it. I'm from Orange County and spent a lot of time in LA and I spent a lot of time in the Bay Area. And so like, I, I knew nothing. And when, it, when a buyer is asking me questions about this neighborhood, that property type, you know, schools, all these things, and I am tripping up all over the place, I knew as a professional instantly that I was at a disadvantage. And so that was like really, I would say the biggest slap in the face because I was very proficient with all the strategies. I kind of knew everything. Like I could literally like do a listing presentation in my sleep, but where I got all tripped, tripped up was there. was like, you know, I, I didn't really have that, uh, that knowledge base. And then one in the training that I offered, you know, one of the things I say is if you can demonstrate, just somehow demonstrate some of your unique perspective and knowledge 
And if the consumer sees that there's some advantage in the knowledge that you have versus what everybody else, they'll be attracted to you. And so that's yeah. been kind of one of my big, you know, bits of advice is how do you demonstrate your unique knowledge, right? And so that's been, you know, so it was really a challenge until I started figuring out, okay, you know, A, it was helpful to be on it. My, my wife and father-in-law were very successful. So I got to go on a lot of appointments, work with, you know, kind of dip my hands in a lot of transactions. And then that's when it was like, became easy. So I was like, oh, you're interested in, you know, whatever, Forest Ranch. And then I'm like, oh my God. Then I tell a funny story. Oh, you know, the FBI cyber investigator that we sold there was, you know, this was the craziest story ever. And I let them know that I have experience in there. And that's usually in the consumer's mind, it's like, a, there's a checkbox of, yeah, you've done it, you understand it. And then B, if I can kind of level up that I know something that most don't, that's usually when I get the client. But Is until there then, it was, it was a struggle. I love that you touched on uh, storytelling too, because right, like we're, people are story processors, right, at the end of the day. And oh, so right. that you did it through, you demonstrated that local knowledge through story. Yes. Can That's, you give me maybe the top three that you decided to focus on? Is it local history? Is it the property type, school district, economic development locally? Is it is there a theme based on demographic? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And, uh, you know, kudos to both you, you know, both you guys, you know, because I've been a, you know, a, a studier of the Norris group and, you know, listened to pretty much, you know, nine, you know, 90% of the podcasts that you guys have done since you started. So I really, wow. you know, have, you know, I've, I've, you know, and I geeked out on economics in the downturn. You know, I think the, you know, I went to the, uh, it was so funny. I was thinking about this the other night, Aaron, as I, as I paid like $3,000 to go to your guys' event in Anaheim, I think it was 2006. The California crash. Something like that. Right. And I was like, this is crazy. Right. But <laughs> that's out of his mind. <laughs> Well, it was interesting, you know, no, it was just fascinating because, and actually my, my dad did say on stage in front of 3000 real estate agents in 2006, he was like, I think this thing's turning now. And he kind of warned everybody. And so I was like, what is that? Now I got the California crash from 2005 and I listened to the CDs, right? So my <laughs> friend was like, there's this event you need to look at this i'm like what is that this is crazy right we had like a big seminar and like all of the agents were just making hand over fist money and every i mean it was just like a it was like a raging party in real estate right yeah. especially in the training world and the coaching world everybody's just making money and it's wild and then this, so the guy shows me the binder the california crash and i'm like what the heck so I listened to all six of the CDs multiple times over. And that's when I was like, oh, no, I'm going to go to that event, <laughs> right? I'm going to check <laughs> this out. This is interesting, right? So anyways, long story short, that motivated me to pay close attention to, you know, how does the economics influence real estate, influence the homeowner, and this whole cycle, right? That's where I got really fascinated by that. And so you know, fast forward now, whatever, how many ever years, when I'm, you know, Aaron, when I'm like sitting, standing next to a buyer or a seller, you know, my ability to talk about, you know, kind of the trends of what I'm seeing, right, of kind of where people are moving from, you know, how that capital is moving, and then kind of what are the demographic trends that I'm seeing, right, that stuff, you know, because I've been trained by you guys, right, right? And Sean, listen to every one of your interviews and all of your talks too. It's like, I could do that really easily now. And I really would love it if real estate agents could kind of bridge that gap, right? Of, you know, it, it just, it's, it's a no brainer to me that like, who's moving in to San Diego right now? It's very, it's like pretty straightforward is like, I've got grandparents following you know, their grandkids, that's happening. Because why in the world would anyone move into a very expensive California in retirement? Because you're following right. your grandkids, right? So that's number one. And then number two, a second trend that I see is I see, you know, anyone that kind of, you know, the upsizers, right? So the, you know, 30 to 39 who are going to move up, they bought and they did really well, you know, within the last 10 years. 
gained a ton of equity and now they get to play, right? So they've got all this money to play with. They've got cheap financing to get. And the trend is very straightforward here in San Diego, South County, closer to the downtown, you know, young, hip, fun. But the moment that you have kids and you, and you want to settle down, you move to North County <laughs> and you come up to my area because it's all, you know, you know, cool, nice, you know, track home communities and beautiful and it's more mellow and great schools and so on and so forth. So like, I just follow these trends nonstop and then I could speak to them, whether or not it's a buyer or seller and I, you know, oh, okay, you know, you're doing that, uh, of course, right? So I've been paying attention to, you know, psychographic versus demographic versus Mm -hmm. geographic and looking at those three things and going, okay, right? How, how does this thing play, right? Oh, so, cool. yeah, and one of my coaches, uh, yes, my, one of my Tom, my Tom Ferry coach yesterday, we were talking about a strategy of exactly what I'm going to use your guys' data for is because I want to pull that group, that demographic with that property type, with those conditions in South County who have this big equity position, who also probably are this phase of their life yeah. And they're going to want to move up, up here, yeah. but they, but they're stuck. They've, they've got a problem. And that is the problem is they've got all this equity and they've got great, a great opportunity to make this transition, but selling and buying, that's the problem, mm. right? And they know that they can sell in 15 seconds or less, but can they get the property up here that they want when they're competing against 15 other offers? So I end up homeless. <laughs> yes. So that's where, you know, I've been really thinking through, okay, how, what are all my, what are the options to serve that person? And then I'm going to use your guys' data to go market to them and say, Hey, here's your, here's your options. Let's book an appointment. Let's discuss those options and figure out which is the best path for you. And I'll help you get it done. Right. What I love about what you just said is one of the the biggest problems we have is people come you know, and they go, they go see a list, right? And they're like, oh, I'm going to send to this list. And they think it's all about the list. And a lot of gurus say, oh, you got to market to this list or to that list. Right. And they don't talk about the message, right? Oh, and yeah. what you just said is, I see an opportunity, right? I can, I can identify who those people are. And now what I have to do is I have to put together the solution, that unique value proposition, the message, to those folks. And then I've got that winning package because it does take that last bit, right? You have to have, you have to solve that problem for them. Yes. Yes. And exactly. I think so many, so many marketers generally miss that piece, right? They either go out with a message and it's not targeted to the right people, right? Or right. they target the right people, but they don't have a message. Exactly. <laughs> and it, it does take both. <laughs> It does. Yeah, I think uh, notoriously, and, and Aaron, you, you all, I want your opinion, but I'll just say this real fast. I think notoriously in the real estate industry, when I started studying direct response marketing and started studying all of the aspects of marketing, I realized real estate agents, we do a terrible job of A, content marketing, and B, an offer. Like constructing an offer that makes sense for that target audience, yep. right? That that your ideal customer, when they saw your offer, they'd be like, I want that, right? And some content marketing that says, hey, I know what I'm doing. If you're thinking this, or you're asking these questions, or if you're in this position, here's here's five awesome things you should know, right? So in our industry, we're really not good at those two things, right? I was just responding to a, a journalist um, who was asking for input um, on marketing campaigns. And uh, early on with Property Radar, one of the things that I was doing as a private lender, I was getting frustrated because Wall Street was coming into my space. And I'm sure you're dealing with this because the I buyers are down in San Diego. They're driving up digital ad costs a lot. So yeah, they doubled yeah. in price. We had hired a company who we were spending several thousand dollars a month. And at the end of the month, I'm like, I can't justify what you're doing. You can show me zero ROI. The content strategy is killing it. And when I combine it with direct mail, very strategically, I can do remarketing campaigns for a fraction of the cost. And I can, yes. So I I completely switched gears, fired the PPC guy, focused on the content strategies, funnel pages, 
murdered SEO because the Wall Street, I had Wall Street a lender admit to me, we always tried to be the Norris group. We couldn't figure out how to do it. It's that hyper local angle. And what do you say to realtors right now? It's like, well, Gen Z and Gen X, they don't want, um, Gen Y and Z, they, they don't want outbound marketing. You're talking about mailers in a, in a digital, uh, digital natives. That doesn't make sense. What do you say to that? No, I t- yeah, I just say that's stupid. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's just, you know, you know, and I, and Aaron, I, I pay attention probably the same kind of view as like the big research in the marketing world where they're talking about, you know, the, the power of text message versus email versus direct mail versus, you know, all the different social channels and kind of what's, what's performing. And so direct mail all, you know, still always performs, right? And it's just, we just need to make sure we have a good message and good content and a good offer, right? And it's not too messy. So it, it, it works. And I, and, um, but I like it. And I like what you guys are going to give me, which is more power to give a specific relevant message to a demographic, a psychographic and a geographic. And, and having that power and that tool makes, makes the message a lot easier because I could speak right to what I know my ideal customer, my avatar would be interested in. So I'll get a better response, right? Very easy. One of the core things that people really struggle with, right, is nobody wants to feel targeted, right? So, you know, it just doesn't sound good. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't, the rest, right? And as a business person that we know targeting works. And so what's, what's the, what's the issue there? And I think the issue is, is that people don't want to feel targeted, but they do want to see things that are of value to them, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and and so that's the key. If you're if you're targeting somebody with things that aren't valuable to them, you're going to make them angry, right? If you targeting if you're targeting them and being very careful in your messaging and not saying I targeted you because, right? Yeah, and instead exactly. saying, Hey, I think you'd be interested in this, be, mm-hmm. you know, and why this is important to you, and it's this is why it's about you. Then I think they're very receptive. To, to targeted advertising, but it, it there's a there's a fine line there. there so is so if somebody get divorced, I don't have to write a postcard like, hey, sorry about the divorce, <laughs> tough times. Hey, you want to sell your house? <laughs> What's worse yeah. is what we get is we get folks that are like, you're getting divorced, so you should list your house with me because I'm the divorce expert, right? It's yeah, all yeah. me, me, what yeah. you have to do for me because of your right. situation you're going to really piss that person off like this. Uh, no. And the same thing with foreclosure. We yeah. get, unfortunately we get customers that still you're well, in foreclosure. You must sell your house to me because you'll lose it otherwise. And I'm like, you're never going to sell anybody with that pitch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the, the classic, um, you know, I studied all the classic marketing gurus, you know, the original ones. And I forget which one of them said, uh, said it, but he said, you know, meet your prospect in the conversation that they're having right now, right? Mm-hmm. So it's kind of enter in at that point. So that's, I've tried to, str- I try to always think through like, what is the conversation that my ideal customer is having right now with their spouse, in their head, with their friends? What are the questions, what are the unanswered questions that they have in their mind? What are they concerned about? What, you know, what are, what are the options they're considering and drive into that and then so right, make my awesome. make my headline or my subject line something that speaks into that because that's many people are having that conversation that perfect target group is all talking about that thinking about that and so if i can get that message in front of them i'm gonna have a great response right i love that i mean you just constantly everything i'm hearing from you is you're constantly looking how do i add value right how do i improve everything's customer centric rather than you centric exactly yeah did you ever read um groundswell um, i did it oh no mm. it was written in 05 um gardner i think was behind it charlene lee and josh i can't remember his name one of my favorite things that came out of that book was the concept of technographics Um, So depending on your demographic, what channels were going to be the most appropriate. Um, And this was in the heyday in 05 when, you know, you posted something on Facebook and everybody saw. Um, 
And I think, you know, I, as we're recording this, I believe there's going to be some social media uh, executives on the Hill <laughs> getting grilled um, about some recent things that happened. And, and it makes me nervous as a marketer. I don't mind participating in social channels, but I, and in, in the back of my mind, I'm realizing I have zero control. And at any time, there's plenty of history that shows these can go out of business. Yeah. Queebly being the, the latest death yeah. of a, are you seeing any trends in the social space? Do you believe in it um, from sort of the things that you're working on? Yeah, great question. So the, the backstory I think is interesting because I, you know, coming from my dad's company, we were anti-social media for a long time. So I worked with his company until 2012. So in 2012, I had a Facebook account with like 300 of my actual friends right and that's it right <laughs> so then i jump over into my brother's company who is like all social all online you know the whole thing and so i got an opportunity to kind of come in objectively and just look at it study it kind of figure it out and then make some decisions about how i was going to operate so i'm a little bit you know i'm a nerd so it's a little bit different for me but I would say one of the things that I'm very keenly aware of today, Aaron, is, is I have, you know, with face, like, let's, I, I basically exactly what you said, technographic. I, when I'm doing what I'm intentionally doing on Facebook is, is for two reasons. Number one is agent referrals is a big play and the Facebook agent communities, the, the groups hmm. are amazing. So I love participating in my industry groups on Facebook. And it's really fun. Then I organized my feed. So I, so you can, you can go to pages that I want to follow. Salada Beach Chamber of Commerce, Encinitas Chamber of Commerce, San Diego Magazine. So I went to those pages and I was like, you know, the, the following setting, which is C first. So first I, I, A, the community, the groups are amazing. I organized my feed to show me more of specifically what I wanted to see. And then the last thing is, of course, I just entertain and educate all of my mom's family. Because <laughs> on Facebook, right, it's a lot of the baby boomers, right? <laughs> so baby boomers are loving Facebook. I'm 45. My wife is 36, right? So the 30 to 39, which is the prime buyers right now and sellers, they're all on Instagram, right? So, so I've kind of oriented my, my very strategically, here's what I do on social and here's why and who I'm, who I'm trying to connect with and speak to and, and try and do everything I can to control uh, what I see to make sure that I'm not you know, getting too distracted. Love LinkedIn, it. of course, is now, I think the most exciting platform, right? Because, you know, I'm a business dork anyway, so I'd rather be hanging and socializing with, you know, if I'm going to be on social media, I'd rather be connecting with great people in the, in the business world who are talking about interesting things, right? And so hopefully it'll get there, right? It's kind of hard to navigate right now, but, you know, it'd be amazing if it actually got there to where it was like a cool resource for, for the business world and for entrepreneurs and executives, right? I, I see a lot of... Uh people in our industry not give social media a job and they get overwhelmed thinking that they need to be on YouTube and they need to be on Twitter. And you're like, well, why, what, why are you there? What are you doing? Yeah. And yeah, they yeah. don't know. They're just like, I have to have it. Yep. That's exactly <laughs> Lock up right. your brand names, but that's about it. Yeah. I think YouTube is very interesting right now. I'm doing a ton of YouTube videos just so I can understand YouTube SEO. Like I want to understand that algorithm and I can see the power of it. It's unbelievable. Right. So I like, you know, some of my, some of the videos that I'm doing right now are, I can't believe how many views I'm getting really. And, you know, as a, as a marketer or an influencer like that, that, that is amazing. And so I'll say this one thing I think is kind of interesting. You guys might appreciate this. I realized if I give the platform what they want in the way that they want it, yep. then I'll get everything that I want. And so I think, you know, I think there's a little bit of, hey, what is the deal with this platform? What do they want? How do they want it delivered, created, positioned, organized, 
do it that way. And as a marketer and influence, all I want is a lot of free exposure to my ideal community and my ideal customer. So I think there's a YouTube SEO, it's all day long. You just tell you tell Google and YouTube, here is exactly the keywords and the my target audience, and you deliver it pretty effectively. They'll go get they'll go put your content in front of your ideal customer for free. <laughs> so I want to delve into this a little bit though, because like I, I think a everything you said is a hundred percent true, right? I don't disagree at all. But yeah for your average individual agent, yes. right? Unless you are a force of personality, there's what, and hours of new video being posted yeah. to YouTube every second. Um, the chances are, you know, you see most of these YouTube videos by individual agents, by most small businesses, by most of our customers, right? And you go and you see their video and it's got 23 views. Okay. So you're, you're immediately family members and your buddies from college watched your video, right? right? Exactly. And, and that's it. <laughs> and, you know, so, um, you know, it's one of the reasons like we're so big on that outbound thing, right? Because you just... Unless you're that force of personality, unless you're a major brand, right? Unless you have your last name, you yeah. know, et cetera, right? Like it's it's hard to break through. It's hard to break through there. Let's talk about at what point does like social become a strategy? Like, is it really more of a thing for like teams and you have somebody dedicated to it or for that really force of personality individual, like who does it work for and who doesn't it? Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, what's what's wild is I've kind of seen, let's just say in the last five years, I've seen very few people make social media uh, create a lot of income for them. Very few, right? Now, as an influencer, speaker, coach, trainer, it is absolutely like an amazing source of opportunity for me, right? Yeah. Because it's the nature of what I offer and the way that I do it. So the, but the problem that I see is, is Sean, is I see that, that agents actually, they don't, they don't think like a, a guru trainer coach things. I, the way that I present content is, let me share the most amazing, best, incredible, unique insight thought, strategy and share that as much as I off as often as I can. And that creates really good reach and interaction. Whereas the agent is kind of like, well, should I post another picture of a listing? You know, like, you know what I mean? Here's my open house is at, you know, four o'clock today. You know what I mean? They actually don't understand kind of what the consumer is interested in and they don't know how to like map a story around it. They don't understand SEO and keywords. So there's a lot of it. And this is kind of where like, it took me a long time to do a ton of research to even get to this point where I have a reasonable understanding of this. So as you're, your average your point, agent, like, is that a, a good investment of time? Nope. I mean, not really. I mean, and now I might, as a, as a coach, I'll, I'll pick and choose. Okay. I will, I'll, I'll do a little you know, a consultative analysis on someone, right? So I have a new client yesterday, you know, 20 year veteran in, a, in Lawrence, Kansas city between Topeka and Kansas city. And uh, his, he's done a lot of YouTube videos. So I'm going to reorg that SEO optimize it. So he starts getting amazing results. Um, but he's like, I don't do any social media. I'm like, that's fine. Now, I do believe he should be getting more agent referrals. And so I'm gonna work on his social media to just specifically try and get him more agent referrals, which I've done that numerous times because I understand the strategy to the, the tactic, the, the platform, right? right? And I and I say and I jokingly say this all the time to my to the to my clients and friends is like, look, it, I think it's the Sun Tzu quote, you know, the a tactic without strategy is just noise before defeat. And, <laughs> and we just, you know, we in the industry, we are just sold tactic after tactic after tactic after tactic. And, you know, it has varying degrees of success. And that's why everybody, you know, kind of loses a lot of money, you know, has a lot of failure. It's because the tactic is, you know, not in the right context. 
of what you're, you know, what we're trying to accomplish, right? And I want to say too, it really depends on the person. You know, Property Radar talks a lot about chocolate versus peanut butter. Peanut butter is the data, and chocolate is this concept of who you bring to the table. Tony Alvarez just needs to get on the phone because he gives good phone. I have other investors that all they use Property Radar for is just phone conversations. They don't do direct mail because they kill it on the phone. So if you've got somebody with a radio face, they don't need to be on YouTube. They're awkward and they'll actually hurt themselves by being on YouTube. So I, so it sounds like you actually go and you look at the person that's at the table and be like, maybe this strategy isn't right for you. Yeah. What, what yeah. skills do you have? What, what yeah. makes you, yeah. Well, yes. Where are you good? And, and, uh, yes, hundred yeah. percent and your market. So it's kind of, there's right. the two things. It's like, what are your skills, your personality, your strengths, your weaknesses, you know, if you don't want to ever, if, if making a phone call gives you the hives or do, not door locking gives you the hives, that's okay. Let's go figure out the other strategies. And there's too much right now, too much general advice, like, oh, this is the way you should do it, right? And you guys experience yeah. this on the, in the investment side. They're like, oh. I was so successful with this one thing and it's amazing and everybody should do it. And you, of course, you should buy my training to you know learn how to do that. And you know, it'll make you a guy in the world dollars. that can do it. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, that stuff is, is it's kind of annoying, right? It drives me crazy. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. You teach, uh, so. The modern agent, you, you brought up that term. Maybe you can define that a little bit more and some mistakes that you think um, agents are making that's going to see them sort of maybe out the door in the next decade. Yeah, it's a really great question. And I will, I will lean on what my brother, uh, Tom, just said at our big annual summit. And because uh, it was a very interesting insight and he shared it to me before he presented it. And he was like, what do you think? And I'm like, yep. And he basically said that the, the solo agent, their days are numbered in the industry. And, and that was fascinating. The reason why he's saying that is not because there's not amazing, beautiful, incredible solo agents. It's because the stack of, two, of things that we need to do today is just getting too great. And so if you don't, you could be a solo agent, but you probably need two staff members, right? You could, and you know, you could be a solo and that's fine, but like you by yourself, mm -mm, that is, that is a real big problem moving forward, right? Let's, let's, let's walk through those models a little bit, right? Everybody's talking teams these days, but it does, you know, it doesn't have to be a team of other agents, right? You could staff up folks behind you that yes. help with marketing and, and all of these things. You can go to third party consultants, coaches to help with some of those things and put those programs together. You can pull together a team of folks that hopefully have slightly, you know, somebody's really good with working with buyers. Somebody's really good at listing. Somebody's really, you know, pull that together. So what do you like? Yeah. What's so that? There's, so there's the three things and you, you hit two of them. So there's the, okay. We're, we're referring to it as the artisan agent, right? Sean, you love, you know, that, you know, uh, Tahoe and you are the guy in Tahoe and you know everybody, you know everything and, and your brand is really strong. So we need to make sure that we get you two or three staff members, one that manages your marketing, one that is, you know, just your, your full-time executive assistant, one that manages all your, your transactions and make sure everybody has an amazing experience. So you can just go do what you love to do, right? That's, that's the ex-Olympic skier in Tahoe. That's model. exactly right. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> right? And then, so then there's the SEAL team, which is kind of what you alluded to second, right? We have people who are expertise at stuff and we crush it as a group and everybody is really on point. I got a listing agent, a buyer's agent, you know, maybe a lead agent, so on and so forth, right? Then we're seeing now we're also been constructing these mega teams, which is really a business builder. So, okay. you know, this is no, you're no longer like I, you know, like I don't really want to go on another buyer appointment or seller appointment if I didn't have to, I just do it. But like, I would love to build a business in which I can construct all of my marketing and lead generation systems, go bring on a bunch of great, you know, salespeople and just have a business in real estate. Right. See so, you know what I mean? So there's people who are really looking at it that way. And that's in the team model, not in the brokerage model. Right. Because you're shielding yourself from some of that liability by being a sales agent, not not a broker. Right. Which I don't want to be there. Right. I want to kind of shield myself from that. So 
there's there's the three models that really are very very exciting to play with today and that's kind of part of my goal you know with coaching clients like okay well first of all which model are we going after and then what right. does that look like and what how would that serve you and your family and your life amazing how can we make sure that you provide great extra that's you know aligned with your personality type your resources your market cool let's make a decision and let's kind of figure that out and let's get you on the path right and but guys i do need to get going because i got to go jump on a coaching call by the way oh my gosh <laughs> right. it is we the whole hour has gone by it's been so much fun yeah yeah thanks guys so and thank you guys for setting it up and doing what you do right because i you know sean i did have foreclosure radar you know at, you know back in the day back and in the I day going yeah. some, a lot of the the marketing reports and the information that you're sharing, right? So that was very valuable. And I'm super excited to see Property Radar go across the country. That's gonna be really exciting. And yeah. a lot of my uh, other data service provider friends, right, are gonna be a little bummed. And that's okay. <laughs> All right, Thank Patrick. you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. And uh, sorry, it. we went over on time. I think both Perfect. Aaron and I were so wrapped, we just uh, weren't paying attention. Yep. <laughs> It's all, it's all, all right, good. Patrick. Have a Thanks, good one. Guys. Thanks. Take have care. an awesome day. Appreciate it. All right. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Data Driven Real Estate Podcast. You can find show notes and links to some of the resources mentioned in the show at datadrivenrealestate.com. Click that join the community and you'll be forwarded to the Property Radar community where you can ask questions about the current show and even see upcoming guests and ask questions there. We'd love to engage with you in the community, so check it out. Please don't forget to like, favorite, subscribe, and share on your favorite platform where you're listening to the show. It helps us out a great deal. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next week.